Larry P. Arn is the 12th president of Hillsdale College. He received his BA from Arkansas State University, graduating with the highest distinction. He received his MA in government and a PhD in government from the Claremont Graduate School. He also studied in England from 1977 to 1980, first as a research student in international history at the London School of Economics and then in modern history at Worcester College, Oxford University. While in England, he also served as director of research for Martin Gilbert, now Sir Martin, of Merton College, Oxford, and the official biographer of Winston Churchill. He returned to the United States in 1980 to become an editor for public research syndicated, and from 1985 to 2000, he also served as the president of the Claremont Institute, an educational and research institute based in Southern California. While at Claremont, he was the founding chairman of the California Civil Rights Initiative, which passed by California voters in 1996, prohibited racial preferences in state hiring, contracting, and admissions. Dr. Arn is on the board of directors of the Heritage Foundation, the Army War College, the Henry Salvatore Center of Claremont McKenna College, and the Claremont Institute. Published widely in national newspapers, magazines, and periodicals on issues of public policy, history, and political theory, he is the author of Liberty and Learning, The Evolution of American Education, published, published by Hillsdale College Press in 2004. This morning, you will speak on the topic, self-government or czarist bureaucracy. I'm certain it'll be very interesting. <laughs> um, we could go on with listing his accomplishments, but on a personal note, um, I think some of his finest accomplishments are that he's a very fine speaker, um, but more importantly, a very fine educator. I'm very glad that we can have him at Hillsdale College. Very proud to say that he is our college president. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Larry Arn. Thank you, Dylan. Dylan's daddy runs a uh, pheasant shooting nirvana. Is that true? In Aberdeen, South Dakota. I've not been there yet, but uh, it looks beautiful. I, I am an old man now, and I'm a teacher by trade. And uh, that means that when I talk in this room, I, uh, my, my, my eye goes to all these people that have grown up around me. I, uh, I, uh, Dylan is not the squirming freshman that I knew <laughs> two years ago. And uh, Geneva Manuel, who's a very pretty girl, is married to Neil Cole. How did that happen, you know? <laughs> Why did she do that? And D. Bob, you know, so David, Professor David Bob, you know, D. Bob. And he told me yesterday, I gave him that name. Yeah, nobody else, he doesn't like it. I don't care. <laughs> but look at him all grown up now and carrying on like he can do stuff. So OK, I'm distracted from my work by the fact that my students are here. Um, I, I, I have something hopelessly complicated today and so I'll to say, and I'll, tr I'll try to simplify it. First, I'll tell you why I think it matters. Um, I don't think we understand what we're up against. I don't think we're good at predicting its ways. I think we mischaracterize what it is about. And I think that we do things that make it stronger, not knowing that we do them. Uh, I think of President Bush, first of all, with longing, of course. If, <laughs> I mean, I even long for Bill Clinton. but. Uh, <laughs> And I think there's never been a finer man occupy the office than George W. Bush. And I think that he didn't know the basic terms of the controversy that we're in today. 
and we need to know them. We need to know what's being sought and done. And I will try to say. I, I'm provoked to, in part to this because uh, uh, I'm in a school of thought, and several of them, several of us acting separately, have been going around saying that socialism is not what is coming at us. Something else is coming at us. It's worse. But it isn't socialism. And it's a mistake to think that it is. I actually believe that Obama tells the truth when he says he doesn't want to own General Motors. I expect he's going to sell it. You know, I don't think he's going to get much for it. <laughs> but, uh, but I think he, he intends to sell it. And the reason is he has another ambition. It's related to socialism. It's, it's a cousin. But it's not the same thing. I'm from Arkansas. You know, we're all cousins. And uh, <laughs> I actually gave a speech in my hometown not long ago. And there was a big crowd there. It was kind of fun. And I said, you know, we're all cousins here. But I said, let me introduce you to my first cousins. <laughs> there were a lot of them, too. What is going on? Uh, the Democrats, I was told, uh, often say these days in the long night sessions that they have to get their bills through on Saturday night, that they often say to the opposition, say Paul Ryan said this, that, uh, yeah, we're very ready to compromise about that. We want to get our architecture in place. That's what we're going to do. We've won the election. We're going to put our architecture in place. What is that architecture? First of all, the original American architecture is worth stating. Um, it is an act of obedience in the making of our country. There is this statement about the laws of nature and of nature's God. And I think, by the way, the first tool or first uh, task in the education of a citizen is to get to a place where you can give a clear definition of what those laws might be. And you can get that clear definition by seeing how they operate in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the people who signed the Declaration in a much more desperate situation than we're in today, although ours is desperate. Because remember what they were doing. They were doing something that had never been done before. You know, to take on the greatest power on Earth in the name of something that had never been a political principle of any nation in history in the name of the rights of every human being, including the right to be governed only by their consent. That's a remarkable thing. And they're saying that to the king. It is the king's point. Um, the siege of Boston was, uh, that means the siege of the United States of America, of the city of Boston, was saved by a circular that the king wrote and had distributed all over Boston, and he managed to get it up among our troops. And what it says is, I'm going to be really nice to you. I love you. I'm your ruler. I'm born to it. He thought that would carry the day, you know. But why did he think that? He thought that because that's what everyone thought. That's what everyone had ever thought. <coughs> It was the only thought. And, and the reaction of the colonists. And what had they done, by the way, except come over here to the new world and cut themselves off from everything and survive and prosper? And their reaction to this thing was like the reaction we're seeing out in the country right now to the things happening in the city. Everybody re-enlisted. Everybody. All of a sudden, there was an army again, because they read this appeal from the king, you see. And if you're going to do something so unprecedented as that, so completely wild as that, you cannot appeal to any law that anyone ever passed. If you're going at the end of the declaration to stake your fortunes and your lives and your sacred honor, and to promise those to each other. Like in this room, us promising. We're going to do something. We swear to each other to do it. It will be a breach 
against one another if we don't do it. It's that. That's what they write, right? It's a battlefield thing. It's a blood pledge. To make that pledge, they have to have some authority for that pledge. And where will they find it? Because there is no authority. They can't really write to the King of England and say, my will is more important than your will. That would be such a foolish thing to say. Have you ever been to London? You know, the king lived in a really great house. And his ancestors, you know, up until the time of the last bloody change of monarchy in England, had lived in that house forever and ever. They were a bunch of Germans who'd moved in there, by the way. But he was a really grand guy. And he had the divine right of king on his side. And so you can't write to him and say, we're going to do what we want to do because we want to do it. And so they did something stranger. They subjected him to the idea that we are the same kind of thing as you are. We are not horses, and you are not born booted and spurred to ride us. You are not an angel appointed in the divine order to govern us. You are a man, and so are we. And all men, as regards governing, <coughs> are created equal. Now that never happened before, right? And you have, to, you have to understand what a fixity that is. You have to understand that that is give up your life over it. And by the way, the life of George Washington was really good when all this started out. He was becoming rapidly one of the richest men in the United States of America. And he was the best dang farmer he ever saw. He could make money. Thomas Jefferson was a hopeless farmer. He wrote these treatises about farming and how great it was. He never could farm. <laughs> you know, he, he, it's true. He made most of the money he managed to make in life. He made by marriage and he made by running a nail factory. You know, with slaves. And I don't mean to belittle him except a little. I'm saying <laughs> he was kind of weird. You know, he was really great. He was a little weird. Washington had this enormous stake. He was connected to the oldest families. You know, Fairfax County? He was married into that bunch, see? And why, why is that county called that? They knew the king. And so for him to say to the king this thing, once the um, British landed on his farm, uh, came, came up the river and and uh, <coughs> stopped by the house, a force. And his uh, brother, I think it was, gave them some stuff. He was mortified. He was the commander of the army at the time. He said, do you know, you've bargained with them. You should let them burn the house. Fortunes and lives and sacred honor in the name of the laws of nature and of nature's God. Now, what that means, really, it's, it, it's explained the best. It, it's, by the way, everybody knows what it means. It's simple. Um, uh, we're all different here, some dark, some light, some uh, feminine and beautiful, and some the rest of us. <laughs> some of us are old. Some of us are young. So we're all different, right? We're not the same at all. And so in what sense are we created equal? And the answer is, bring a pig in here. Just bring one in. And everybody, admit it. Like if somebody walks in the back now, late, there might be a little stirring, not much. And we'll glance at them. And if we know them, we'll be interested. And if not, we'll forget about it in two seconds. But if somebody walks in here with a pig on a lead, we'll go, wow, the pig does not belong here. It is not the same kind of thing. Douglas says uh, to Lincoln, not uh, Fred Douglas, but Steve Douglas says to Lincoln, uh, you say that I can take my hog and my buckboard into Nebraska and have my property protected in it. Why can I not take my slave? And Lincoln replies, you can if there's no difference between the hog and the buckboard and the slave. But you know that there is. Because you 
in the South, your friends and you, he, Douglas from Illinois, your friends in the South who perpetuate the institution of slavery never pass a law hanging a pig for murder. But you do slaves. And you never pass a law saying you cannot teach a hog to read. But you do slaves. You know what they are. You cannot resist the knowledge what they are. It is born in you. Aristotle's account of that, by the way, is uh, very beautiful and fun. I'm looking around for an object. I, I won't do it today because it's too early in the morning and some of you were up late last night, as was I. But I will tell you that what Aristotle says is, when we look at an object like that cup right there, we see more than any other creature on Earth sees, and we see it instantly and automatically. We don't just see that that's a white thing, you know, and you might sniff it and see what's in it and knock it over. We have two dogs in our house, and that is exactly what they would do. <laughs> and, the, and the little short squat one would actually find a way to get up there and do it. You know, he'd make a fool of himself. What we see is cup. And you know, that guy's got a cup, hold it up. And it's different. And if that were the cup, that would not be a cup. And so you never see the cup. And yet, you recognize everyone you ever see. And that means that uh, when you look at the world as a human, as a rational creature, you see a much richer world than any other living creature. And because you know what category that is in, it makes you instantly available to identify whether it is a good one or not. And so come to find out Aristotle's argument, but also Thomas Jefferson's argument in the Declaration of Independence is that everything you see as an act of sense perception is also at the same moment an identification of a moral world. We live in this weird world today where we think it is proven beyond a doubt that that hard thing is made out of moving, rapidly moving parts. And that, you know, in movies, they're always doing this now. They're always saying somebody, like The Matrix, was kind of built around this idea so far as it was built around consistent ideas, that you should be able to stick your hand in it because it's in motion. And we think that's an objective fact. But we think it's doubtful that I should not treat the students at Hillsdale College the same way I would treat my dogs. I do kind of treat them the same way. but. <laughs> But I expect more of the students because the dogs are stupid. And, uh, and uh, they, they respond to some of the same things. But the students are human, and that means that moral knowledge is apparent to them at everything they see. It springs up. Aristotle even says it is the reason we can identify things. What he says is the good and being are convertible terms. And what that means is if you punched a hole in the bottom of the cup, it would not only start being a bad cup, it would also stop being a cup, and it would start becoming a funnel. That's what he says. So these laws of nature and of nature's God are apparent to us because we can see, and they're a fixity. And only humans can see them, and all humans can see them. And the wrong of slavery has always been apparent to all who have practiced it. And that is why in any society, ancient or modern, that is why in the first few pages of Aristotle's politics, slavery is spoken of as a necessity, but with apology, it is always a doubtful institution. Because everybody who, of any serious thinking who has looked at the question down through history has said, it is not right unreservedly to treat a human like it was a pig. That's how America was built. And it is the first thing in history built on that idea. And now we have a new idea, and I'll try to say what that is. The new idea, I'll mention this philosopher Rousseau. I don't know why. I got up this morning. Of course, I'm tired. I was up too late last night, as you were. What are you doing here this morning? I have to be here. But why are you here? So I'm going to talk about this philosopher. What Rousseau writes in the second discourse is, we're born in this state of nature, and we don't know anybody else. And the first time we run across people, we invent language. So language is not in our nature anymore. It's a development. It arises. 
And the key thing about human beings that make them what they are is not rationality, the ability to see the rich moral world implicit in the cup. It's what he calls malleability, which might be translated as change. Isn't it odd that that word should become the master word in our politics? Change. The great thing about human beings is that they change. And all of a sudden, we're interested in a narrative now. It's not that ancient man knew, as we know, that human beings are not to be treated as pigs. It's not that when I josh these kids that I know so well, right? Because you, you, by the way, everybody, you, before you die, you should go work in a college for a while. You'll become an expert on growing up. It, you won't grow up. but. You can watch others do it, right? And they come and they look like little kids. And they leave and they look like grown-ups. And it happens in four years, precisely. Neil Cole, he looks like a man now, right? He didn't used to. It's recent, you know? <laughs> it's very funny, you know? And I know his character. I watched it display itself. It opened up as he was growing up, right? He's a good kid. He went to graduate school somewhere, and he had a moral objection to things they teach there in the sciences, for goodness sake. So he changed. Isn't he a weird guy? It's great. See? That's nature. And that's, by the way, why mommies and daddies matter. Because when he was 21, he still needed his mommy and daddy. And other creatures don't. It's not looking at the world that way anymore. It's looking at everything as change. And once you see that everything is in motion and that now you are the special creature given the gift to see that fact, are you not therefore appointed to control the process of change? What if you could bring the tools of modern science to bear upon human affairs? What if you could control everything? What if you could make everything right? There's a contradiction, but don't, don't, don't think about that for a minute. The contradiction is obvious. What do you mean by right? The old guys had this idea of nature. They had this idea that in sense perception and thinking themselves, which are the two things conjoined to make the human being, and they're not separate. They're the same in the human being. There's only sense perception in the animal, see? The idea is that makes us, that is our divine spark. That is why we can see the difference between a man and a beast and between an angel and a man, right? They, people who think like that, they can use the term right. People who think that everything is changing and you could get control of the process. They can't use that word. I will read to you from the president. Implicit in the very idea of ordered liberty is a rejection of absolute truth. The infallibility of any idea or ideology he writes that, audacity of hope. Compare. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. The rights of mankind are not to be rummaged for among parchments. They are written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature. That's Hamilton. It's a paraphrase. That's one way of talking. This way of talking is implicit in the very idea of ordered liberty is a rejection of absolute truth. And by the way, this is written by a man who seeks power. And the obvious question is, what restraint will there be on its use? What 
principle of restraint could there be? Do you like to have conversations with 18-year-olds? I do. It's just great, especially if they're smart. And you know, at our place, they're smart. And it's just so much fun to torture them. Because <laughs> you ask them, you know, it's easy to get them to say the word good, and then it's easy to ask them what it means. It's just step one, step two. Everybody at the college is used to it now, so they avoid me. <laughs> but it's not very big, so you can't get away. And you'll say, you know, you said good. What does that mean? And they'll say, you know, they, they, they learn the standard answers don't work. But the standard answers are, well, doing what you think is right. You know? Because the modern mind doesn't want to say anything is right. And so I always bring up Hitler. Hitler is handy in this regard. I always say, you know, he really thought he was right. You know, he was going for it. Or as the, what, who's that press lady at the White House who says that Mao lived his dream? <laughs> Dunn, is that her name? And she reads him every day. She's living her dream, right? How are you going to criticize that? If everything is change and the tools of science are to be used to control the process, have you wondered why those climatologist guys in England should be such liars? Because it's counterintuitive, isn't it? Because think what they are, right? First of all, they're very intelligent people. Second of all, they have, they have survived two decades, no, three decades of serious academic work, challenging, difficult, hard, demanding enormous virtues of perseverance and seriousness. They are at the top of their field. How can they be just simple liars? That they are liars is clear, but can they really be just simple liars? In their own mind, are they in the wrong? It's not possible to think that if you just think about them for a minute, right? What they are instead is pioneers of a new world in which science is wedded to administration and everything can be managed and perfected. And they know, they must know, that global warming is a stalking horse for that kind of regime. It is part of the architecture that is being built. And that means that you do not have to own things if you can regulate them in any way that you please. Indeed, it's not a good idea to own things. Because what would you regulate? What will it be like? It's coming. First of all, community organizing is going to be a big deal. It is a miserable experience to be organized. I'm, I'm going to mention the book 1984. It's an extreme thing to say in one way, and I don't mean to say that uh, these people imagine a world like that at all. But I want to mention a particular feature of the book. If you want to understand, by the way, the totalitarian impulse, the two blessed places I know to read it, I mean, you can read Marx and stuff if you want to. I did, and I got over it. <laughs> read uh, 1984, Orwell, a communist who reformed and uh, was horrified by what he was involved in, and read Darkness at Noon by Arthur Kersler, another of the same type. But in 1984, what's going on? There are these three parties, right? There are these three groups of people that appear. It's a regime in three parts. And the proletariat, they're left alone, and they're happy. The great thing is to be one of them. Um, they, uh, they only appear, well, they appear as poor. They appear as a prostitute in one case, a poor, old, ugly prostitute living a miserable existence. But then the big study of them is when uh, their, uh, Winston Smith and his mistress are in their secret room, by the way, where they get to have privacy. See, and that's what you cannot have. You cannot turn off the television. What do airports seem like you today, to you today? I cannot bear, I, use, I, I have like four sets of fancy headphones, 
and, uh, and uh, once in a while, the lady on the airplane will say, uh, you know, sir, you can't, you can't really have that in while we're talking. And I will say, but dear, that's why I want to have it in. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to engage in public transportation today is to be lectured and ordered about wherever you go. And you know, I do it all the time. Today, I'll be doing it. You can't turn off the television. Winston and his, and his girlfriend look out the window, and there's a lady, and she's singing an old ditty. And it's vaguely. Uh, resonant with them and she's hanging up clothes it's beautifully described and and uh, she's living normally she's unaffected the hope Winston Smith thinks is in them and the other two parts of the regime are the active parts the inner party a world of despots struggling one against the other for power over the outer party, which is what Winston Smith is. And the outer party are the people who are regimented. They are made to exercise early in the morning. They can't get a razor blade. They have to listen to a television all the time. And by the way, if they don't do what's supposed to, the person on television can see them and will talk to them and make them do their exercises better and stuff like that. Now, I mention that because a regime like that is imagined. It's kindly imagined. In that regime, there's most of us. And according to American progressivism, we get to rule. We get to decide. Ideas are proposed to us from an active, scientific, and technical administration of very large size. And we hear these ideas. And we vote once in a while, kind of like a big plebiscite. And we decide whether this will be implemented or not. But the process can't get dangerous for the administration because the government has become such a considerable force that it's not possible. What was that? Is it the Heritage Foundation sign or ours? <laughs> I'd like to say that I'm a trustee of the Heritage Foundation <laughs> and fully entitled to speak under its banner and will proceed in that vein. So I'm nearly finished now, but if there's acorn, is there more going down? <laughs> Thank you, dear. There you go. Thank you. It, uh, if there's, if there's, wh wh why, you know, by the way, why were they outraged that Sarah Palin said, kind of like a community organizer, but with real responsibilities. <laughs> you wouldn't know it. I didn't know it. But there's a class of person who does that. And it's a large class. And it's a powerful class. ACORN is, by the way, a very large body of people funded by the government to work upon us to influence elections to influence the government in its decisions, to bring lawsuits against corporations to make them behave the way it thinks they should. And the government then has actually appointed people to work upon us. And that is a direct abnegation of the central arrangement of our old regime, which is that the society is separate from the government and sovereignty is located in the society. Look at the health care thing. It's, the public option is not a separate thing. It's all the public option. You know, I, I got Mr. Kreinbill to look it up, because I keep hearing that it's going to be unionized. The whole health care industry is going to be unionized. How would that work? Personal Care Attendance Workforce Advisory Panel. That will likely impose union affiliation to qualify for a newly created, by the way, who could ever remember? I have to read these words. I read them this morning. I can't remember them. And I, you know, I, I have a fair memory. I can remember Hamilton. Personal Care Attendance Workforce Advisory Panel impose union affiliation to qualify for a newly created Community Living Assistance Services and Support class. 
Can, can anyone assign any meaning to those terms? <laughs> you know, they don't mean anything. It's a new world created by the will of man and things are not descriptive. Teacher, minister, surgeon, nurse. You know what those are? Right? Those are things in nature. You know, as long as there's been people, there's been those things. Right? Personal care attendance workforce advisory panel. The way you do broadcasting is that you uh, form an advisory panel. And they decide who gets a license. And licenses have to be renewed every other year. And the, work, and the advisory panel represents all of the diversity groups. You see? And then they meet and they decide if your programming has been good enough to qualify. And of course, there are union reps. And there are, so, so you meet in a group. I used to say at the air, I used to fight with the Air Quality Management District in Southern California. It's, uh, it's awful. They had 1,200 employees, and they had 100 of them doing PR. Probably they got 2,000 or 3,000 now. And I used to argue with them a lot. I went to a, me at the Claremont Institute. We once made them take back a rule. And their whole idea, I said, you know, I'm going to start a body parts organization. Because every time you do, you guys do a panel, you got the lung association and the heart association and, the, you know, all the different stakeholders, they call them. That's a term from Hegel. And they all get together, and they all, by the way, have an interest because they're all grantees. When I started causing them trouble, they said, uh, they called me in and said, would you come and visit the director and the chief of uh, community relations? I said, sure, I'll go down there. And so we had a long talk, and they said, you know, this is uh, really interesting what you're doing here. We'd like to have your help. And I said, well, you know, you got it. And they said, well, we'd like to give you a grant. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I don't really want a grant. And they said, but, you know, you, you, we'd like to have your help. And I said, you're going to get it, you know? <laughs> I said, you see? But they, they, at one point she said, I don't understand one thing, she said. She said, uh, you say that we spend too much money because, you know, the way these things are funded, all these local regulatory agencies on environmental stuff, they're funded by the fees and fines that they impose on the regulated community. And so they fine you, and if you don't like it, you appeal to them, right? And they're living off the revenue they get from you. And you've got reason not to, to, to uh, protest about it. And she said, you say that uh, we've got too much money, but then you want us to charge. Instead of regulating, you want us to charge for pollutants. And I said, correct, that's what I want you to do. I mean, if you're going to do it, that way everybody will see the cost and the market can adjust. And that takes your discretion out of it. But she said, what are we going to do with the extra money? And I said, well, there might not be any extra money. And she said, why? And I said, it's the difference between a regulatory and a revenue tariff. Regulatory tariffs are high, and they don't yield much money. What you're trying to do is keep the goods out. Revenue tariffs are low. A lot of goods come in. You get a lot of dough. And this woman said to me, wow, that's brilliant. <laughs> and I replied, no, ma'am, that is elementary. <laughs> you see? But the point is, in your dealings with the government, your interest is married, to quote Woodrow Wilson, to the interest of the government. And so you lose the one thing that you must lose. And under the regulatory state, the one thing that everyone will lose, which is their independence. You can keep your ownership of your property. You will hold it on title from us in all of your use of it. And that, by the way, is the economic principle of feudalism, born again in this country. And I will stop by saying that there are two things to do about this, and they're easy to state. The first is we have to develop a clear way of talking about this that is accurate. We have to study the laws of nature and of nature's God so that we can say what they are. We have to study the bureaucratic way so we can describe it as it is. We have to do that relentlessly. 
we have to start producing not big administrative bureaucratic platforms from both parties, but short and simple and beautiful platforms from one party, whichever one turns out not to be evil. Right now they're both evil and both stupid. We have to produce clear and simple and beautiful laws. And when we get ourselves to an intellectual state where we can produce that kind of thing, then we have to talk with all our might and all our eloquence and all our hearts to our fellow citizens because they alone can save their freedom. There are our two tasks and there are no others. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. If you would, for the benefit of uh, the recording, wait until the microphone comes to you, and then stand up and, and address uh, your short question. Uh, Dr. Arnold will be pleased to, to answer it. Any questions? Uh, this is sort of a constitutional question. When, um, since you quoted Hamilton so often, when Hamilton was arguing with um, Madison and Jefferson over the establishment of the first bank, he used, I believe, the general welfare clause as his justification for that. Do you think that in some ways he won that battle or lost the war? Uh, well, yeah, in some ways he did. But um, <clears throat> do you understand what the issue is? Is uh, um, in Article One, Section Eight, there's 17 clauses, and they're all specific except the first. And the specific ones are things like coin money and regulate the value thereof, and you know, go kill pirates is one of them. I don't think they put it quite that way, but that's what they meant. And, um, and then, this, you know, uh, necessary and proper to the general welfare, right? Is that how it reads? So the point is, here's my answer to that. Uh, the Constitution, we have to, in my opinion, it's not as important to conceive it as a specific set of prohibitions and and empowerments, that comes second. The first thing is to understand its grand structure. Because the Constitution from the first days was fraught with hard cases. Uh, Jefferson struggles over whether you can build a harbor to defend the port of Boston, right? There's no build a harbor, right? You can't read that in there, but there's defense. Is that OK? He kind of wants to say you can't do it. But then he's stuck buying Louisiana. So, so the truth is the Constitution can be read intelligently if you understand its large purposes, which is to keep the federal government to a few grand things. And by the way, to have a lot of power over those, but to have almost no administrative power over our ordinary daily lives. And I'll make the distinction before you, for you. The biggest subsidy ever given in education is in the Northwest Ordinance. Uh, second biggest is in the Land Grant Colleges Act in 1862. And in both of those, what they do is they take a section of the Western lands, their idea about the Western lands being to get it into private hands as fast as they could, and they reserve it for education. But the but uh, but the, uh, the the vehicle is, and this is so beautiful, by the way. If you go if you go read the Morrell Act, it's called the Land Grant Colleges Act, or the Homestead Act, or the Northwest Ordinance. I think the longest of those is five pages long, and they're lovely documents. You know, the Northwest Ordinance says religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall ever be encouraged. How do you do it? The answer is you got this asset. Give it to the state on condition that the state use it for the purpose of education. End of story. There is no one to whom the state could report. Now, if they abuse the privilege, I imagine somebody could sue in federal court and say, you know, you got this for this, but now you use it for that. 
you know, this, in the Northwest Ordinance, in the Land Ordinance of 1785, it's the 16th section of each township of 36 sections that is reserved for education. I know where that is in Hillsdale, Michigan. It's just a little bit north and a little bit east of our campus. And if you go follow the deeds all the way back, and they will exist all the way back, you will see that at one point that land belonged to the state and the state either devoted it to education or sold it and used the money for education. If they didn't do that, you could sue them. And so there's no administrative authority over anything local or detailed and concerning the regular citizens of the country in Washington, D.C. And if you can achieve that again, then this question about the bank and about the harbor and about the Louisiana Purchase won't matter so much. Because the heart of the evil that we have today is this enormous administrative class, the bureaucracy, which is large enough to interfere with everything and powerful and large enough to influence the outcome of elections. So now, all of a sudden, elections become powerfully influenced and eventually may be dominated by people who are really judging in their own cause. What I mean by that, they vote the way they get. So you see, that's my point. And my point then is the Constitution in the grand sense, and I mean the whole of it, the structure of it with its division of powers and, you know, of, of its division of labor between the branches, its uh, you know, because here's another accident from the Constitution. Uh, the Constitution Convention is called because Madison and Hamilton in the main are concerned about violation of rights in states. <clears throat> they want a strong government. They actually agree, although, you know, they later fight like cats and dogs over stuff like this. They agree at the convention and propose that the government of the United States should be empowered to legislate in all cases whatsoever. Now, these guys, by the way, there's no way they're trying to build a despotism. Look who they are. Look how they risked their lives. Look at the treason they had committed, right? So their idea is we need a strong federal government to legislate wherever it needs for the great national purposes. They can't get that through the convention because this other party is saying no. States are very important. We don't want to give it up. We're not going to build a thing like the King of England again. And what has worked out is not so much the grand compromise of the Bill of Rights, although that's important. What's worked out is the system of enumeration reinforced by the system of states electing senators by state legislatures, which gives states a tool to defend their authorities my argument is states don't have rights. People do. And, and, you know, that means, by the way, that the 17th Amendment is the worst amendment ever passed. If you could get back to that world, then it wouldn't matter very much how strictly you interpreted the 17 clauses. It's the fact of them and the indication of them in general and then the lack of a federal domestic bureaucracy that our protection should be in. Does that make sense? Okay. Lindsay Hoban, U.S. Court of Federal Claims. Could you explain how the apparent value of humanity applies to abortion and embryonic stem cell research? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, human life has a, a different and higher dignity than uh, other life, although all life has a dignity, and animal life for sure, which has sense perception, memory, and intelligence, is not to be abused. But human life is special because it is uh, uh, immortal. And what immortal means in the religious sense is not what you need it to mean here. What you need it to mean here is it is aware of the eternal and lives its life in accordance with that and the universal in its ordinary operation. And so it was made with a power that is divine and beyond any particular situation. 
it's uh, human beings are odd creatures. You should read. Uh, I just uh, I'm just finishing a class on the Nicomachean Ethics of Aristotle, and it's such a beautiful experience to do that. You know, the kids are real smart, and and we just are having just a fantastic time because the, the we're we're, in, we're next next is class is the last class, and it's on book ten. And we actually somehow got through it for the second time in my experience. And uh, books eight, nine, and 10 are about friendship, happiness, and pleasure. And they're the culmination of the great book. And in the book, what's described is that uh, pleasure in the beginning of the book is uh, suspicious, suspected. It's uh, demoted. It's uh, confined. It's uh, told. You're told not to listen to it. At the end, uh, it's purified, and it becomes the point of your life. The point of your life is the feeling of, your, of the acti proper activity of your being. But you're a compound being, and so these highest things in us, like, you know, when, when, if we've had a moment this morning where we're thinking about things quite beyond ourselves, things that are high and beautiful, and we maybe have had one. Last night, we probably did if you were there. That's the best thing in us. But we also have all these needs. Well, it's these needs that we have that lead us to hurt each other and damage each other. But we ought not to do that. And uh, that means that the details of things like that, those, those questions of abortion and stem cell research, is that you must not treat human making as a manufacturing process. You must not treat a human being, the life and well-being of another human being, as a uh, factor of production in your own well-being, because that is like slavery. So that's how you think about it broadly. This will be our final question. Um, I'm undoubtedly fascinated by the intellectual um, analysis of the situation with President Obama. Um, but I don't think, and this is just my humble opinion, that we have time to develop a f whole class, a citizenry, that can approach overturning what's happening within the time that we have. Um, so other than suffrage, which will happen in um, about a year, um, and hopefully we will be able to turn around some of the things that are happening, um, what would your recommendation be for people like me that are out there in contact with you know, activists and even our children and our children's friends and you know, our children's parents to somehow steer the country in the right direction? Good question. Uh, so I'll just say a few points. First of all, we don't have to develop a class of citizens who have these basic points in their mind. They already exist in a considerable majority, and they've proved it in recent weeks. Uh, this stuff that I just told you is all kind of fancy and sophisticated. I used to say to my dad before he died, uh, my dad is a school teacher in Arkansas, and I had my uh, young and stupid period. Now I have my old and stupid period, but uh, <laughs> I used to argue with him about stuff when I was in college because I had you know, about 18 months where I was pretty liberal. And uh, later in life, one of the great satisfactions I gave him was that uh, I said, you know, I've spent a long time dead now learning complicated reasons why you were right. He, he loved that, right? And I have more complicated reasons than he had. But where did my father get his education? He got it from undergraduate college. You know, and by the way, they're not very good at teaching in undergraduate college these days. That's a blessing. <laughs> I mean that. It really is. They can't. The stuff they're trying to teach, it's so counterintuitive. The kids have to be really brilliant and have a little bit of a despotic ambition in them to, to take to it, right? Most don't. And then my dad, you know, he grew up on a farm in the Depression, and he was a hunter, and he had three children, and he uh, 
got himself through college, and he served in the Army, and he married my mother, and they were married for 53 years, and he watched us grow up, and most of us have, you know, somehow managed to work out okay. In other words, he got his education from life. And it's very hard to get around that. Most people are not gonna, gonna get the fancy education that made liars out of those elite scientists in England. And that's one reason why the populace of America are so stubborn about this stuff. So I don't expect everybody in the country to follow the argument I just made. I can hardly follow it myself, <laughs> as you could tell. What we need is simple. We, uh, we have the force in the society to turn all this back. They need some leadership. They need some people who can think and who have courage and are high-minded to take the lead. And uh, by the way, those people are in office right now. I named several of them. They're, you know, I, I just had an inspiring couple of days, right? And a lot of those people I've known for a long time. Their characters are fantastic. And they're not on the list of people who might run for president. One of them might run, actually. Pence from Indiana says he might run. Here's what he says. He's such a, such a self-effacing, fine, talented guy. He says, I was saying for a long time that I have a calling not to run for president. And I'm not saying that anymore. <laughs> Which is not saying he's got a calling to do it, right? And he means that. He's a very self-restrained man. So there's two jobs, right? And one is whip up the people, communicate with them. You know, and to the extent you can teach them about the meaning of their country. You know, we do that. We're going to have an online course so everybody can understand the Constitution. And it'll be simple and complex, depending on how far you go. But then the other thing is, find some people who are really great and try to get them into positions of influence. So I'm going to try to make a few congressmen famous. And uh, I go around to them. I'm, uh, as you can tell, I'm a frightful lecturer. I'm just, uh, I've been ruined by my job in one respect, and I had a native tendency that way anyway. So I go and sit with these powerful people and tell them how they ought to do their work. And they like it. You know, I don't, at least they ask me back. And they, they do because they know I love them. And one of the things I tell them is uh, friendship is the deal. So you guys all have to get together and work. And you've got to not care who gets elected governor and attorney general and president. You've got to serve now. Country really needs you. It needs the best in you. It needs your selflessness and your high-mindedness and your cooperation. Uh, and they know that. You know, who are they? I'll name them. Uh, Paul Ryan, Mike Pence, Tom McClintock, John Shattuck. I'm forgetting some now, but there's, you know, 15, 20, 30 of them, maybe 40. Fortenberry, I just met him yesterday, walking down the hall from Nebraska. It's just great. So the point is, they, you know, so by the way, the two elements necessary are in place. They're just not in the right order. Now, it matters a lot the next two or three or four months. Everything should be done. You know, I actually just hesitated to say this, but I'm a citizen. I'm going to say it. It is my personal recommendation as a citizen, not deploying the resources of any organization represented here, that it is very urgent matter first to delay and then to defeat this bill that's going through the Senate right now. If it can be delayed, it might be beaten. And it will be mighty good for the country if it can be beaten. Because it will put infrastructure in place that will be terribly hard to repeal. But never say that it will not be repealed. So there you go. And remember, you don't, just, what I just made today, I'll close with this point, was a defense of common sense. And we've all got that, don't we?